Um, and he's going to talk to you today about breaking out of application sandbox environments. Kirk Hayes. Thanks. Uh, is this on? Can you yes. Hear me? Okay. Well, maybe move this up a little bit. So I'm excited uh, to be here today. Uh, Dave gave a, gave a great talk, um, and I think there's a lot of great talks on tap today. Um, hope, hope you guys are excited for this one. I know I am. I'm excited to be here. Uh, mainly because I can finally tell my family and friends I went to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> thank you for laughing at my lame jokes. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about escaping Alcatraz today, and uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, this is a little bit about who I am. Patrick already talked about me, so we'll just move right on. Um, so we're going to look at a lot of different things today. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at the history of Alcatraz. Uh, you'll notice that Alcatraz is in quotations. There's a reason for that. We're going to look at the island, the prison of Alcatraz, but we're also going to, I'm going to define what I mean by Alcatraz for the purposes of this presentation. We're then going to move into some escapes and uh, how we break out of, of these. And we're going to do it at different levels. I'm using the Wolfenstein 3D uh, levels because as a kid, I loved playing Wolfenstein 3. Anybody played that when they were growing up? Awesome. So you'll know how these different levels uh, got gradually harder and harder until you got I Am Death Incarnate, and I never could get through that. So, uh, But we will through this one, uh, through these escapes. We'll talk about some mitigation techniques, how can we stop or uh, at least figure out that somebody's trying to escape. And then we'll wrap up with a little conclusion here. So. A couple years ago, I was doing some work out in the San Francisco area, and I'm a big history guy. So when I go places on vacation or for work, I like to go visit uh, historical sites. Um, it just gives the history kind of, instead of it's just in the book, what you learn in school, really being able to touch and, and see things uh, means a lot for me. So when we were out there, of course, I had to go to Alcatraz and uh, it was a ton of fun. So how many, anybody have been to Alcatraz? Number of you, okay, great. Um, so some of this you'll know. Um, Alcatraz opened in 1934. Uh, it's this island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. Um, San Francisco Bay, if you don't know, is not warm water, it's cold. Um, it gets up to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit at the warmest. That's, that's in late August, September. At 60 degrees, hypothermia kicks in. Um, within an hour to two, you'll pass out uh, from the cold. So it's a mile and a half to the closest shore. How long do you think that it would take to swim a mile and a half? Anybody have a guess? 20 minutes? No. <laughs> About an hour and a half. Um, my sister-in-law does triathlons and, and, and a lot of these things, and so she'll swim this type of distance in warmer water, uh, but in the ocean, and it takes her about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half, and she trains for this. So a mile and a half, hour and a half to take, uh, approximately, hypothermia is kicking in within an hour to two, uh, it's very unlikely that somebody, if they try to escape, get, they get past the guards, they get past the walls, they get past everything, and they s try to swim, it's very unlikely they're going to survive. So uh, the government kind of thought, uh, this is a great place for this prison, what can house some of the most notorious prisoners here, and they'll be safe. Well, in the 29 years of operation, there were 14 escape attempts. Um, this was by 36 prisoners. Two of them tried twice, 23 were caught, six were shot and killed, two drowned. But the scary part is there's five unaccounted for, and they don't know what happened to these. There's been reports that uh, they've been seen uh, afterwards, but we don't know for sure if they survived. And if we think about that with our computing environment, that can be kind of scary. Uh, if you set up your network and you, you try to secure it, but if there's five unaccounted for malicious actors in your environment, that can be kind of scary. So uh, we've got to be careful with that. Now, 
I don't want to just talk about the island. We want to talk about what we're really here for, which is these application sandbox environments. And some of the technologies we use are the Microsoft Remote Desktop. You can use this and do web applications, publish these applications to the web, log in, access them just like uh, they're on your computer. I don't recommend it. I've used it um, just as a proof of concept. It was terribly slow when I tried doing this. But it's great for, for management and trying things out. We also have VMware View. Uh, they're a thin app, which is what I used when I was a sysadmin. Uh, works great, uh, allow, allows you to just publish these apps and, and, and it's very easy to manage. Uh, and then if you ask anybody Citrix, everybody knows what Citrix is. It's probably one of the, the, the leader um, in this space with application virtualization. Um, but we can apply these same concepts that we'll learn today to kiosk PCs. So you go to the library and you want to look up some books and you have the, uh, the, the browser window uh, that's locked there for you to look it up. Well, can you escape that? Can you get out of that to get access to the underlying operating system? Uh, it's, it's possible, right? So we'll look at, at that as well. <clears throat> so what's the purpose of these applications? Well, simplified management, uh, we, we're, we're, we're expected to do less with, or, or more with less now. Um, we don't want to uh, hire more people and, and all that uh, companies. So if we can simplify this management, it's going to make it easier for us. Uh, we want to be able to provide remote access to our, our resources uh, easily for our users. Uh, we want to deliver these applications to any device. So if my sales team or my executives want to use their iPad to access some Windows 98 uh, application that can only run on Windows 98, we want to be able to do that. Um, and so this allows us to. Um, and then we can centralize that control of those applications. So I can provide an application that's all set up, ready to go for that user and specify who who's has access to it, what they can access, and, and really control that application. And so from a, from a an administration standpoint, this, these things are great, and we want to do this. Um, but as the malicious actor or as a pen tester myself, I want to be able to break out because having access to an application is cool. Having access to that data is okay, but I want more, right? I want to, I want to start moving around the environment more. So I want to escape out of that if I can and then keep moving. But to escape, we need a good escape plan. So this map it shows the locations that uh, those 14 escape attempts were made from, um, and by who, the dates, all that stuff. But each of these attempts, they had to have a plan. They couldn't just wing it. They're not gonna do well if they did that. So they have to get everything ready. Maybe they have escape rafts that they have to build. Maybe they have to get a job in a certain part of the prison so that they can gather the materials they want. Um, they have to know where they want to escape from. Uh, the one kind of at the top, escape attempt 13, those three of those, uh, there's three guys in that one, and those three of those were part of the five that are unaccounted for. Um, they needed to know where they wanted to escape from because of the way that the current was running in the water and, and everything that would help them be successful. So we want to do the same thing. So I've created a little, uh, escape plan here for us. So the first thing we want to do is, of course, obtain access to our Alcatraz. So what's that mean? Do we want to get arrested? No, we, we're not going to prison. Um, we have to gain access to that computing environment. So if it's Citrix, if it's VMware, whatever it is, we need to gain access. So how do we do that? A number of ways. We, kiosk PCs, we can get physical access. Uh, these virtualized, uh, maybe we do password guessing. That's usually the easiest way. Um, people are very, uh, choose weak passwords and we can just guess. Uh, and often that's how we get in. Uh, the second thing we want to do, of course, is figure out how secure this application is. And so we do this by just poking around the application, using it normal. Um, usually if you use, use it the way it's designed, 
we can start seeing flaws in it um, based on what we've done in the past. Um, this is where the prisoners are getting that job in that certain area. They're doing the reconnaissance of uh, where the guards are when um, and, and figuring out what the best time is for their escape. Um, then we want to set up our attack infrastructure, and that's where we set up our command and control channels. We set up uh, our maybe a Metasploit or Empire listener of some sort. And so we get that all set up and ready to go. This is where, of course, our prisoners are creating their escape rafts. Uh, again, they're probably not going to make that swim, so let's create a raft so that's, uh, maybe we can make it. Um, and then we escape the application. This is where we actually get code execution. We can um, get access to the underlying operating system and out of that sandbox environment. And this is where the prisoners have escaped and they've, they've made that attempt. And finally, we profit. We gain access to other resources, other data, and that's what we want. Uh, this is where the prisoners get their freedom. But the prisoners now have to do something. Uh, they can't just live life normal. They have to keep their eye over their shoulder at all times. And, and as a attacker, we need to do the same thing. Um, I need to make sure I'm, I'm careful in what I'm doing to cover my tracks and to be quiet so that way I'm not detected and uh, the prisoners would be sent back to jail. We would be kicked out and possibly the loopholes that we found will be um, blocked, so we need to be careful there. So, we're gonna get into some escapes, and, and so we're gonna have some fun with this. We're gonna start on the easy level. If you played Wolfenstein, this level was so easy, you just blew right through it, um, and so that's what we're gonna hit here. Um, keep in mind, some of these demos are heavily blurred, and that's just because the data that's in them and uh, to protect the systems that, that are uh, being recorded. So. Uh, so this first one, this first one is a, the remote desktop um, web access. Uh, we've gained access, and for all of our attempts here, we're gonna assume that you have access. We're not gonna cover that part. We're gonna kinda go the other steps. And in this case, the application is Internet Explorer. This is very common. We see this all the time. And uh, it's most applications, or most companies, when they do this, uh, they wanna be able to provide access to their internal resources, uh, internal websites, so they give access to Internet Explorer to do that. So, Internet Explorer is a lot like another explorer that's in Windows called Windows Explorer, right? Um, a lot of the code is, is similar, that they do the same functionality. I can uh, access files from Internet Explorer, so why not? So I'm gonna type in the path to uh, the command prompt, because that's one good place to, to start with, uh, for this. So, we type it in, we run it, and we have a command prompt, right? Very easy, there's no, uh, no difficulty here at all. And we can run basic commands, and so I'll, I'll run through, you know, what's the host name of the machine? Um, maybe what are, what's the user I'm running as? Um, what are users on, on the system or in the domain? We can type all these commands, we can start running executables if we want, we can, Whatever we want to do at this point, we have access. Um, in this case, we're going to also look at who's the domain admins. And uh, on the domain, we notice that DA3, who's the user we're running as, is a domain admin. Again, this is easy level, right? This is not likely to happen in the real world, but we need that tutorial kind of to, to get started to see where we can uh, start from. The second demo here, again, is pretty easy, uh, and same Internet Explorer, but we're gonna right click and go to view source. We're gonna save the source as, and gives us kind of a pseudo Windows Explorer. We can just right click on computer, open. Now we have access to the, the file structure. Um, and then we'll go navigate to C, Windows, System 32. Uh, and then this time we're gonna use Windows PowerShell because um, 
usually that's a lot easier, we can do a lot more with it, and the same kinds of commands that we had as before. Um, we can run our host name and all that stuff. So very easy, not very hard. Um, usually when I play a game, I skip that easy level and I go right to the next level or, or even harder. Um, but we needed to kind of understand how we start, so that gave us that. So we'll, we'll bump up the difficulty a little bit and we'll do don't hurt me. And I like to think of this as more of a, a maze. And so this maze, you know, you can look at it and you probably can figure out what the best path is without even trying. Um, my three-year-old did this maze and you can see she, she traced the whole way without getting stuck once, which is pretty good. And then she proceeded to pretty, make it more pretty. So she colored it and uh, now you can't really see the path, but that's okay. <laughs> but it was even easy for her, she's three. So um, again, there's multiple ways as well. So maybe there's multiple ways to escape we gotta look at. So in this demo we have an old version of Wind, uh, Microsoft Word. And so we're gonna try to open a file. We're right clicking, things aren't working that way. Uh, we can't right click and open because of the, the, the version of it. Um, so we're gonna look at some different things here. We don't even have a C drive, so we can't go and navigate the, the drive. Um, again, we try using it somewhat normal and we poke at it. We try to see where we can escape from. And so nothing is working there, so let's look at some other areas. We'll look at the, the print dialog. I like to use the print dialog because uh, it's not usually thought of, of a good place to escape, but it's easy to escape from, from that. So maybe we could try, I tried looking for a printer in the directory, the directory wasn't working, had some issues there, maybe look at the options. There's nothing really there. Look at the properties of that printer. Sometimes you'll see uh, files, paths in there that we can mess with. Uh, it's important to always change that printer to different printers because the, the different properties. Um, in this case, we have a default folder, so we can browse and look at it. Again, it's an older version of Windows, of Word, so it might not be as easy as some of the newer stuff, um, so we're just gonna get out of that. So we'll, we'll try some other things, maybe in the Help menu. And we notice that Microsoft Office Online, so let's click that and we get access to our Internet Explorer browser, which we had fun with before. Um, so we're moving, we're making a little bit more progress here. Um, we have no file menu though, so we can't do file save as or open or, or any of that. Uh, maybe we can try navigating to a website uh, here. So we'll try going to Google. Nothing's loading. Um, they may have some kind of web application proxy that's stopping us, so, or, or uh, a proxy for the web that doesn't allow us outbound access. Maybe we can go to the internet options. Um, and so going to the temporary internet files areas is, is a lot of fun too because they have links to where those are stored, where those files are. And so uh, if view files doesn't work, maybe view objects will. And now we have access to Windows Explorer. So we can try typing in the path and, and doing that. Uh, but this is gonna be un unsuccessful. Uh, they have some protections in place for this. Again, this is that maze where we're butting up against dead ends. Okay, let's move another way. Let's try something else. And so in this, we're gonna create a new folder. Just as, a, as an example, there was nothing on there. But likely you'll find folders um, within my documents and stuff for that user. And in this case, when we double click it, it moves us to a different Windows Explorer, Explorer 2, which is a little more powerful. It's kind of like the PowerShell of Windows Explorer. It gives us a little more, and now we can start uh, to play and, and get more access here. So we're gonna try modifying the path here to just the C drive, which we didn't have access to through Word, remember? And now we do. So now, again, we'll go system32, and we're gonna try to run the command prompt again. Now we get a message that software restriction policy is in effect, and that's blocking us. So 
Um, now what do we do? So maybe we can copy this file off and move it to our My Documents folder. So create a, a new folder, just throw it in. We'll paste it in there and we can now try to run it. Now this ran because the software restriction policy was based on the path. But like David said, maybe renaming the file would work here. Uh, different, different options. So now we can start enumerating things. This application uh, was a little more difficult. Um, you'll notice kind of up in, in this area, uh, there's Excel uh, icons. And so we, as we poked around here and we're using it normal, we, we see what, does the, what do those do? And so we find that it, it allows us to save the data as an Excel. Um, so let's save it. And once we save it, it actually opens it in Excel, which gives us access to another application. Um, and if we go to the Excel options, we can go to the, the ribbon and we can enable the developer tab, which isn't enabled by default, um, but gives us a lot of control. So now if we go to that developer tab, we can now run a macro, um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so let's, let's create a macro. And in this case, uh, I like to use Unicorn um, to do this. Uh, Dave and them over at TrustedSec uh, made this, and, and it's a great tool to, to really easily make those, uh, the macros. So we'll just generate a macro here. Uh, we'll copy it, and we'll paste it in. Um, usually this is used in phishing attacks and things like that, but hey, I have control of a, a remote Excel. Why not try it? So we'll paste that in. But now we need to get our attack infrastructure set up. And again, uh, Unicorn makes it nice and easy by giving us an RC file that we can just load into through Metasploit and not have to type everything out. So we'll load that in. And this is going to establish our listener. So now we're our attack infrastructure is set up. We figured out where we're going to attack, uh, escape from. And so then we can, once the listener is up, we can actually do the escape. And uh, we got the cow say, so it's likely to succeed whenever you see that. So our listener is up. We'll run the macro. We'll get an error, which is in the macro itself. So I don't care. I don't care about saving it. Um, but then we'll switch back to our listener, and we found that we have a session open. So now we can interact with that machine. We could pivot into the internal network. We could do what we want at this point. So again, it's gotten a little harder. It, it's not too hard, though, so let's, let's get a little harder here. Again, we've got the maze. It's, it's a little harder of a maze, though. You probably can't look at this and figure out the path like that, right? It takes a little more. You have to kind of play with it. My six-year-old son um, tried doing this, and you can tell that he hit a lot of roadblocks on the way, but he was able to finally do it. And so we may do the same thing. We may find a lot of, of blocks, but if we keep trying, we'll, we'll get there. So we're back to our remote desktop here and our Internet Explorer. So we'll run that. And this is the problem that I have with uh, remote desktop is it's just slow. So uh, even on the local network, that's why I never used it. So we'll just run this. And this time we're as a different user. Um, hopefully when you're doing your password guessing and, and you're starting these processes, um, you have multiple accounts that you can have compromised that you can use, so you, if one is burned, you're okay, and you can move on. Um, so in this case, we have the file menu, and we're gonna go um, open, and we're gonna look around and see what we can do here. Um, often I'll find that a lot of things are locked down on, on the system, but um, interactively. So I go to the command prompt or PowerShell. So we'll go to the command prompt here. And I'll right click and open. 
and I'll find this message. But it's been disabled by the administrator. This happens a lot. Um, so I can't interactively use this command prompt. Now, I could try moving it, I could try renaming it. Um, in those cases, maybe it all fails, but let's, let's try some other things. And so we'll do all files, and we're gonna actually create a file. Um, sometimes you could download a file if you have access to your own servers, but in this case, I'll just create one. We're gonna just give it a generic name, whatever, uh, PowerShell, and I'm gonna open that. Now I have Notepad, so now I have a little bit more access here. And so we're just gonna try calling the command prompt from it. Uh, and uh, I like throwing the pause in there when you, you do non-interactive because uh, just in case it just closes, um, you can pause it and, and see what's on the screen. Um, in this case, I can't uh, go to the properties to rename it, so I'm gonna have to reopen it and save as, um, so I have a batch file. Um, this could be done with VBScript too, um, or any other scripting language that you might want to use. So we'll give it the bat extension. And then we'll try right clicking open, and we'll see what happens. And we see we've hit another uh, dead end here. We, we can't do that. It's not allowing us. It's been blocked by the administrator. So let's, let's change this. Let's use PowerShell instead. Often when you see command prompt is blocked, PowerShell's not. So let's try it. So again, we're going to right click and open. And this time we have PowerShell. But it was PowerShell through a batch script which uses command prompt. So we have some kind of execution there. So even if you don't have access to PowerShell, you can't run those things and nothing interactive is happening for you, you can at least run commands. So um, I do this often when, when I'm trying to enumerate the system and figure out users and uh, from the domain and everything else. I can run it, throw that pause in there, and now I have the data I want and just can go from there. So, Let's move to the hard level. Um, I like to think of this as this kind of maze, right? Now we have uh, the Minotaur in there, we have fire, we have, maybe the walls are changing on us as we're walking through this labyrinth. Um, so it's, it's actually extremely hard. Um, when I played Wolfenstein, I stayed away from these levels because I just got killed. Um, so again, we have another app, and this time we're gonna hit uh, the shift key five times to get our sticky key prompt. And even if we don't get that command prompt, we can still do things and we can open up the preferences for um, the sticky keys. And that gives us control panel, uh, Windows Explorer. So let's try some things. Let's try running these files. Um, and we're trying PowerShell, we're trying PowerShell ISE, we're trying command prompt, um, and these things are all failing on us, and so you're gonna hit this. You're gonna, these systems are more locked down. So maybe we can um, try running a, a, an actual command uh, through command prompt, and it's not working either. Um, we'll try opening a notepad or something. That, things are just not working for us, so uh, we'll see we're blocked at all, all these different places. Um, and so I can't even right click, they've disabled that. So sometimes we can go to the settings and get a Internet Explorer window, which is back to where we like to escape from. It's, it's a good place to escape from. So we have no file menu. Um, this time we can get to the internet, so I can get to a server that I control. I have a batch file waiting for me. I wanna download that, but um, it's not letting me, so maybe I can go to the internet options and, and allow it, but they've blocked that too. So again, we're, we're a lot harder here, but no file menu. Um, I can't right click and save as to do uh, this or view source and, or any of that stuff. So that's not the best way. So let's break out of here, go back to the application. Remember, we wanna use this as normal, so let's see what we can do. So we, we start clicking around and we find export to Excel, and so let's see what happens. 
well, we get an Excel document, right? In this case, that Excel options were locked down. I couldn't enable that developer tab, but why not use um, the cells to put in the macros uh, that we want or, or the commands we want? So here I'm gonna try with PowerShell, and I missed the quote, so um, we'll run that. Hit yes, let's run it, and nothing happens. Okay, so let's try with our command prompt. Uh, this is likely to fail as well, and that's okay, it happens. We'll run that, nothing happens as well. But when PowerShell is blocked, a lot of times PowerShell's interactive scripting environment's not. And so we'll run PowerShell ISE and run that, and lo and behold, we now have PowerShell's interactive scripting environment, which is great. Now I can do whatever I want from there. Uh, load, load in my own custom modules, run commands. Um, everything auto-completes for me, so it's nice and easy. Uh, so here I'm gonna dump all of the users in the domain, so then I can use those in other attacks. Um, if I wanted to, I could use the Unicorn or, or another uh, Empire or something to get a shell if I wanted, uh, whatever you wanna do at this point. And then for our last demo, this one is uh, extremely tough. I don't know why that's not playing. Let's, uh, let's just open it up here. So the export didn't work on that one for some reason, so we'll just skip that one. Um, in that one, sometimes you'll get a system that you can't get command execution, you can't get anything to load, but what can you do with it? And in, in that example that was not playing, um, I could steal data, right? I can. Uh, I was able to finally get to the, using a, the printer menu, I was able to escape out and get access to the file system, and I could mount my drives on that system. So now when I do that, um, I can then start moving data back and forth between them. And I was able to steal all their data, which is great, um, especially their custom proprietary software, which then I could pull off, decompile, uh, find, you know, different flaws in, and then um, without even trying, uh, then uh, exploit their system a different way, um, their, their proprietary software. So, so what can we do? We, we need to be able to mitigate things, and, and um, I don't like to just show, hey, this is how we, we own things. Um, we want to be able to also mitigate these things. So um, first thing we want to do is, of course, those login portals. If I can stop me from logging in, that's gonna go a long way. So use the multi-factor authentication. Train your users to use those strong passphrases. It's gonna make my job a lot harder, and it's gonna make it harder for me to get through. Um, you wanna secure your operating systems. These issues you saw are not issues with VMware. They're not issues with Citrix um, or remote desktop. They're issues at the operating system level. We have to secure our operating system and our applications that are on those. So prevent access to your command prompt, your PowerShell, PowerShell ISE, um, a lot of these different things that um, Dave had talked about as well. Uh, restrict the use of those macros. Um, I, shouldn't have to be, I shouldn't be able to just load any macro I want. Uh, you should be able to limit that and restrict it. Um, the internet access really, I mean, why should I connect to my company and then get out to the internet through Citrix? Um, the purpose of that should be to access internal websites, so limit that access. And then monitor everything. Um, it, you, you, you have to be able to know this is happening. Uh, I've been hit, I hit a lot of walls while I was trying things. 
And you should be able to see that when you're monitoring. So in conclusion, you know, securing your systems, it's not a game. Uh, we had some fun with the Wolfenstein and, and the mazes and all that stuff, but it, it's hard work. And so we have to be diligent and do that. Um, using multi-factor authentication, um, again, it's your friend. Lock down those shared systems no matter what architecture you, you select. Um, and of course, you can't catch what you don't see. Um, escaping is, is a lot of fun. Um, it, for me, it's, it's one of my uh, favorite things to do is, is get access to these systems and, and then escape them in some sort. So it's a lot of fun as well. Um, and so that's it, thank you. And so, some of my contact information, some of the tools I've written and stuff, uh, if you want to, if anybody has questions, of course, uh, it'd be great, so thank you. Uh, so, have I been stopped by a general purpose kiosk uh, where multiple applications are available? Um, I don't see those a lot. Um, personally, when I'm, when I'm doing testing, a lot of it, most of it is all through the virtual applications, so your Citrix, your VMware, your, that kind of thing. Um, but what I'm saying here is just the same things can apply to those systems as well. Um, yeah. I. Again, those locking down those, those management tools is, is probably the biggest thing there, and monitoring those, those systems would be uh, the biggest help. I, I have not, no. Uh, 